Hi, my name is Oded Eze, and I am a typoholic. <laughs> Thank you. This is Meg. She's an architect from Seattle, and she wrote me an email three years ago asking me if I'm designing tattoos. I said no. And she disappeared, and I'm, I was okay with that. <laughs> Half a year ago, she wrote me again, saying I have to design a tattoo for her. And this time, I didn't have the heart to say no. She wrote, I'm looking for two related tattoos that are technically typographic, my grandparents' initials, but to the casual eye, simply graphically gorgeous. Wow. <laughs> She sent me photos of her grandparents from one side, with their initials, and her grandparents from the other side with their initials. I told her it will take me a few months to think about something. <laughs> She said, I'm waiting for three and a half years, that's okay, I can wait more. I was thinking, how can I make type behave in a way it will speak about time. Immediately I thought about timeline, naturally. And then I said, okay, so we have timeline, we need to have initials, and of course we have something like that every day. We use our handwriting, and it looks like a line, and it has type. Together with that, I've been thinking I would like to pull inside also the infinity aspect of life. And what I did is some sort of a grid built from these circles, and I put the initials of one side of her parents on this grid, and the other side again on the grid. And I did a, the same thing with her own name, Meg. And then I wanted to take it even further. What I did, I photographed myself with a computer uh, shooter, and... <laughs> forget this. And asked her to photograph herself so I can demonstrate what I want to do with that. So my idea was that if I can start the tattoo from her finger, like, going to her arm, having her, initial, uh, her parents' initials on one arm, going up and to her neck here, and then again, going down, have the other side initial, and finish with the other finger. Well, she loved that, and actually, only recently, this whole project is really, really new. It was never published, right, uh, by the way. And she sent me some uh, tiny photos from, from the tattoo artist and their hands after that. And she wrote me a beautiful email. She wrote, my mom is anti-tattoo, generally. She was in town visiting me a couple of weeks ago, and when she saw them, and heard the explanation, she was so surprised and got a bit teary. And I was thankful for this email. Skype type. This is um, the Jewish cultural festival in Krakow. And I didn't know, but this is the biggest Jewish festival in the world. They have 300,000 people coming to the final celebration. This is amazing. And they wrote me an email. Uh, actually, the founder of the festival wrote me an email saying, I will be in Israel uh, next week. Can I pop into your uh, studio? And I said, be my guest. 
And he came and he said something like that. They are uh, existing 20 years and they don't have a logo. They use uh, the logo of the castle where the festival is happening. It's called Kajimiers. I hope I pronounce it uh, uh, well. And he asked me a very simple thing to do, to make it Hebrew. I said, no problem. You have the letter K, let's take the letter Kuf instead. Kuf for Krakow, Kuf for culture, cultura, uh, Kuf for Kazimierz. Great. And we have the crown, let's replace it with a shield of David. And then I started development to get this symbol. And I made uh, an English version and a Polish version, a Polish version, <laughs> and also a Hebrew version to it. They were very, very pleased with that. In fact, they were so happy, they asked me to design the festival poster as well. And I was very happy, and they said, yes, but we want the logo to be the, uh, uh, the player over there. So what I did, I, I added a bit of color to, to the whole thing. It wasn't enough for me, so I did three. And I said, why don't we hang it in the street, each street, different color, but you know something, I wasn't happy. I wasn't happy because the whole idea of this festival is about people. It's from the people to the people. A lot of people are having fun, and I didn't find this in my own design. And I've started to think about ways that you, we communicate today. And of course, naturally, I thought about Facebook. By the way, I'm not on Facebook anymore. I'll tell you maybe some, sometime else about this. <laughs> I've been thinking about Twitter. I am on Twitter. And I've been thinking naturally about Skype. And there it was. I thought it would be really, really nice if Skype can design my poster. So I started to ask my friends all over the world to create one letter for me. And it was amazing. It took three days, three very intense days. I was very tired after that, but very happy. Because even people that I didn't know responded. And that was great. And that was the result. The result was people all over the world, most of them Jewish, asking the people of uh, Krakow to come to the festival. And it worked very well with, uh, with the other posters. And that's how they used it, actually, on the street, cafes, on walls. inside the rooms, and so on. I was very delighted uh, to find out that Stephen Heller wrote about this in print magazine as well, but I was even more delighted to get an email from print magazine itself saying, we are going to publish a, uh, an issue and to ask 11 designers to say whatever they, they like, and we save you one double spread. Wow, great. Immediately, I thought to use Skype type for this double spread, and I came up with a phrase saying, every improvement in communication makes the truth less visible. And here it was when the people say that. And of course, between uh, one word to the other, I use the user not found screen. I, I, was asked, I was asked to come to London a few months ago to give a lecture to the LCC, London College of Communication. And I, I wanted to do something special because I have a family in London, and when I was 13 years old, I got a present, a birthday present from my parents to go there to my uh, mother's sister and to stay there for a few weeks. 
And I remember it was 1985, and I remember that when I went off the taxi, I've seen this. And I was amazed by the creativity of these people, and I was 13. <laughs> uh, so for the, the trip to London, I thought it would be nice to combine this with typography. And that was the result. <laughs> and I actually came on stage with this and answered questions and things like that. But I wanted to speak about something else. I got a telephone call from uh, the founder of a shoe, shoe fair in Israel. And she said, I would like you to uh, help me with something. They are going to make uh, an exhibition of non-shoe designers that design shoes in order to help the Center for Victims of uh, Sexual Abuse. And I, 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 I get these calls uh, uh, often, uh, asking me to do pro bono works. And, you know, when I, when I had this uh, telephone, when I, when I had this conversation, I thought to myself, if I come up with an idea now, on the phone, and I tell her my idea and she likes it, then okay. If I don't come up with an idea, I, 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 don't, I give it up. So I asked her, what are the statistics of the uh, sexual abuse in the world? And I got, a, I think it's crazy. She said, one of three women uh, are, some, ha, are going through some kind of sexual abuse. One of five women is being raped. And one of seven women uh, have some kind of sexual abuse in, in the family. So that's what I asked her. I asked her this, can you bring me a bucket of paint? Can you bring me a pair of shoes, of women's shoes, white women's shoes? And can you bring me a huge paper? And that's what I did. I just wrote with these shoes itself the numbers that she gave me. Because my idea was that in this exhibition, the people has to see not only the result, the shoes, but also the statistics, so journalists can ask her what is one to three, one to five, one to seven, and then she can explain. And these are the shoes. And that's how they looked after that. And that's what they sold. Thank you. I'm, I'm jumping from one thing to another. I, I think, I, I hope it's okay with you. Uh, okay, I live in a small, small city called Give a Time. It's walking distance from Tel Aviv, from the heart of Tel Aviv. In fact, I can walk 30, 40 minutes and get to Tel Aviv uh, by walking. And I got a request from a site called City ID that run by young uh, uh, guys, and they asked me to design a logo for my city. And I went into this site, and to tell you the truth, it was too trendy for me. I mean, I mean I, I'm not kind of a trendy guy, and, and, and I, I, I thought this is not for me. But then I thought I can do the opposite. So I went back 3,000 years to the times of King David. And I don't know if you know, but uh, Hebrew then uh, was slightly different. And I decided to write the name of my city in ancient Hebrew. And later to give it a trendy look, to have a personal joke about that. They really liked it. That's how it looks in the site. Thank you, thank you.
Okay, I'm going to go into the more radical things. Um, I'm very much uh, uh, affected by mysticism, uh, especially Hebrew mysticism. Um, for instance, this, uh, what I showed you before are uh, circles of meditation. If you read them, you're supposed to get into the state where you understand the, the words of God better. Uh, that was 450 years ago from Babylon. And this is uh, the name of God written from top to bottom, just like Japanese, and has some very deep meaning for each letter. This is a bowl from 500 years ago from Damascus or Babylon, I don't remember now. But the thing is, if you can see the writing, which is upside down, meant to do the following. If you have a devil in your house, he should read this, and then he get caught. And then you just throw him out of the window. <laughs> and I really wanted to do something with this. I, I think it's marvelous, but I didn't have any idea until I saw this. This is an Indian dancer uh, uh, dancing the rain dance, and I understood what I'm going to do. I'm going to form a typographic religion. <laughs> and of course, I want to have some rituals. So if two believers of this religion uh, meet, they dance the dance of typography. <laughs> and of course, I wanted to be the shaman of this religion. I wanted to be the chief. So I made this custom for myself. <laughs> and the whole project was uh, specifically done to a conference in south of France where the, uh, uh, the theme was secret. And there I revealed the fact that I'm actually the type of shaman. And I was on stage <laughs> like that. And <laughs> thank you. And you know what? After, <laughs> after the presentation, I had two students coming to me saying, we want to be your first believers. <laughs> I said, that was a joke. Forget it. Now, they, they were serious. So I, you know, <laughs> I had to. And a few weeks ago, I got this from a student in the US saying the typographic shaman has to have the typographic bird. So I was thankful to him. So if we have a typographic religion, we need to have typo mythologies. So I'm going to tell you a secret. I'm going to tell you how mankind and language came to the world, because I've heard it here. This is a small figurine that my wife bought from a, an Ethiopian uh, Israeli. And I was thinking, this is beautiful. And immediately I thought and started to, to wonder about, what if I am a typographic researcher, typographic uh, someone that is looking for sociolo sociology uh, matters and things like that. And I find in an encyclopedia two very weird uh, drawings of some kind of creatures that are half human body, half letters. And I ask around, and people tell me that there is a tribe inside Africa that uh, probably these figurines came to America when the slaves uh, uh, were shipped there a few hundred years ago. And I, I, was, I, I really wanted to, to know more about it. So I went to Africa, and I was hosted by a, uh, uh, the chief of this tribe, which told me this very, very interesting story. He told me that thousands of years ago, their gods fell down from earth to the ground. There were giants that had half the body of humans and the head of a letter. And they lived like that for centuries until one of them or some of them did something wrong. And then the, the chief god w was so uh, angry, he went down and chopped their head down. And that's how this chief 
uh, chief uh, uh, telling me, that's how human being came to the world and the um, language. And he said, uh, uh, while pulling something out of his bag, that until this day, they pray to these small figurines uh, uh, so it will give them uh, knowledge and to thank them. And he gave me one figurine like that and asked me to come back to my people and to tell the story because they become more and more Western. So now you know the secret. <laughs> of course, I invented it all. <laughs> okay, and now to something completely different. I'm, I, I love to, com as you understood already, I love to combine other fields and typography in order to find out what else can be done with letters. And, of course, uh, plastic surgeries are so common these days that I had to do something with that. So I decided to add some <laughs> letters to, in this case, the letter Aleph in Hebrew, to my face and to my, uh, the rest of my body. And this is the letter Gimel uh, and Pei. And, but I didn't stop there. I thought it would be nice if I had a scar tattoo. And then when I come to your place, I can print it all over <laughs> your place. And I will finish with three projects that I did under the theme of biotypography. Biotypography is uh, generally the, the method of applying biotechnology into typography. I must admit, I never did something like this for real. These are only the ideas, but I'm sure it, in no time we will be able to do things like that. For instance, I was very much into uh, uh, insects when I was little. I, 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 I'm the guy that brought his mother, you know, uh, these kind of insects to, at home, and she, she used to scream. But especially, I was interested in ants. I don't know why, but that's how, how I was. And I wa wanted to combine letter with an ant. And at first, I made some sketches, and I just glued the letter on top of, 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 a, of an ant. Uh, but, but then I thought, this is not it. I mean, I wanted to feel as if I inter, in, interfere the ant's DNA and create uh, some kind of creature that is uh, neither ant, neither letter, but both. And that was the result. A series of uh, ant creatures made of foam, and I don't remember what exactly what that. And I imagined, what if I had these ants for real? And they would come to my studio on the floor and write together the word water. I would know to give them water. <laughs> Later on... <laughs> Thank you. Later on, I, I, I saw this uh, incredible thing. I think most of you saw that, the, the, the ear, human ear, that was uh, uh, growing on, on, a, on a mouse. And immediately I wanted to use it for my own purpose, so I met the Ephrat. <laughs> Typosperma. <laughs> was the second project of this biotypography thing. And for this, I made myself a typographic scientist. My idea was simple. How can I uh, combine or interfere again the DNA of human sperm to create a typographic creature? I began uh, some kind of a research, and that was the first sketch of these creatures, but I was not satisfied yet because it, it looks like I'm trying to force the letter into the uh, uh, sperm. I didn't want that. I wanted a real creature. So I made this. And this is, if you look carefully, you can read Typosperma. <laughs> and of course, the letters are not developed yet, okay?
thank you. And, and this is a big S. And, and you see all these uh, typospermas wanting to dive in, to go in. And later on, I really wanted to make as if I caught this under a microscope. So I went to a very good friend of mine who is a product designer, and he helped me to uh, transfer from two-dimensional to three-dimensional creatures, and the result was this. This is the letter P, typosperma P, and then you have three letters, P, A, and S, together. I was very satisfied. Um, and, and do, thank you. And, and I, was, I, I was surprised and, and really, really amazed to get a, uh, an email from Paola Antonelli of the MoMA saying, I, we saw your work, we want, you to, uh, we want to include that in a MoMA uh, collection. I was, wow, thank you. Okay. Later on, I saw these uh, drawings by Leonardo da Vinci. You all familiar with that? And of course, I wanted to in put inside the typographic side. So I, I made some sketches of uh, embryos that have some typographic information inside their body. And if you can, you can read copro in English and copro in Hebrew and copro in Arabic. And I use this uh, for a uh, an identity for a, uh, an event in Israel uh, with the name of Copro uh, that deals with co-productions uh, uh, of, of, of uh, uh, filmmakers, Israeli filmmakers with uh, the rest of the world. Uh, I must say, this is the weirdest identity I've ever done. <laughs> I would like to finish this presentation with the last work I've done under the title of Biotypography. Uh, it is a homage for this person, uh, amazing designer, Herr Blubalin. He is not with us. Uh, he, I think he died uh, in the mid-90s or something. He's an amazing designer and influenced me a lot. What you see on the left is the mother and child logo. Mother and child logo was done for the mother and child magazine, but the magazine was never published because they couldn't find uh, the finance for that. They couldn't find uh, enough uh, advertising. Uh, so this is the most known logo in the world for a known product. And also it has the embryo inside, which made me start to think, what if Herb Lubalin was alive now and we could chat and I could tell him what I would like to do? And I made uh, a very, very short film. It's, it's less than one minute film and I want to show you uh, uh, um, now. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.